Thank you very much for the privilege of the platform to be here. Uh, you get a little nervous when you get asked, even by people you know, would you come speak to a group? Because you're always worried about first impressions. You with me? The first impression that comes across may not be the first impression you were trying to get across. You ever had that happen? Yeah. I'm working up here. You ever had that happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So there I am. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, getting ready to speak to a group. And if you want to get a speaker to cringe, to kind of pull back and get nervous, all you have to do is on the agenda where they're listed, before they're speaking, put the words open bar. <laughs> so I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, speaking to this conference. There's an open bar before I go on. And how do I say this nicely? There, there was a gentleman there who was determined to get his share. <laughs> you with me? And, and anybody else's. And he was uh, an older gentleman, and he was with a much younger lady, and he had determined that he was going to impress that younger lady. And he had also determined I was going to be the impression tool. <laughs> so he's talking to this girl, he's talking to this girl, and she's typically, yeah, whatever, okay, I'm here, yeah, okay. And she's like, you know, how do I get out of this, you know, and all of a sudden he grabs her by the arm and says, come here, we're going to go over, I'm going to introduce you to General Bowles, come on. I'd spoken to this group a couple times before. So he drags me over. I got a name tag on, it says speaker, you know. Yeah. So he drags me over and says, there, this is General Bowles. This girl doesn't know General Bowles from General Motors. <laughs> She's looking like, okay, whatever, hi. She's polite, nice to meet you, but you know. And he decides he's going to like, you know, impress her. And he looks at her and says, well, hits her by the elbow and says, watch this. You know. General, anybody ever told you you look like the guy in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Y'all familiar with the TV show Breaking Bad? Yeah. Brian Cranston, yeah. Walter White. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the girl even like snaps in and gets introduced and looks like, looks at me, looks at him like, really? You know, I, I look at the guys, it's her. I have to honestly tell you, nobody has ever accused me of looking like Brian Cranston, Walter White. That has ne just never happened. <laughs> And the girl's nodding, I'm like, yeah. And he finishes his drink and says, no, 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 no. I met the other guy, his brother-in-law, the fat, bald DEA agent. Anybody ever tell you you look like that? <laughs> uh, no, sir, nobody's ever told me that either. Uh, so I walked away, he walked away, and I looked at my, my watch, put my drink down, walked over to the guy running the thing. It was about, so what time is it? He said, 6.15. I said, what time am I going? He said, he's going about 8.30. I said, okay. I said, I'll be back. He said, where are you going? I said, the gym. No. <laughs> so you're always worried about the first impression that comes across and the first impression you got. That's a true story. Okay. John asked me to talk about leadership. And I could go on about that for a while. But what I'm going to do is give you a couple of things that have been FARs for me. Uh, FARs are flat-ass rules. They've just been rules I've had when I've been leading folks. And then what I'd like to do is open the floor up to discussion and questions. Does that work for you? Come on, it's Friday morning, I need to know if the coffee kicked in. Okay? <laughs> Fake it to you, if there's nothing wrong with this room, 40 push-ups and a four-mile run wouldn't cure. Okay? <laughs> and you're all looking at each other saying, who's going to volunteer? <laughs> uh, John t told an interesting uh, story. I'm going to start out with a question. Uh, I want you to think for a second, who works with you, who works for you? Why do they work for you? Why do they work with you? Why they get up every morning, clean up, shave up, and come bask in the glow of your charisma every day? <laughs> Why they do that? Do you know? People look at me and go, wow, you're a retired two-star general. You, you were somebody. You had a plan. Yeah, I had a plan. Uh, my parents were uh, Irish immigrants off the boat from the west coast of Ireland. Uh, they came to America. Uh, my mom... Uh, was the youngest of 12. She had uh, five different gentlemen in Ireland come and propose and ask to marry her. So they went to her mom, not her dad, interesting, went to her mom and said, I'd like to marry your daughter. And all five times, her mama said, no. After the third one, my mama got a little interested. After the fifth one, mama said, I, I'm figuring out where this is going. I'm going to be the old maid who stays and takes care of mom and dad. That's their plan. She said, I got to get out of here. So she went to England, learned to be a nurse, went to America, came there and did that. My dad 
was uh, working on roads, doing stuff, got a little frustrated and I owned, so he came to America. And are you all familiar with the TV show Flip This House? Yes. Yeah. You know how it works, you know, two people get together, spend $50,000 on a house, put $10,000 into it and say, we're going to sell it for $400,000. Yeah. Reality is always a little different, isn't it? Yeah. Oh damn, the foundation is cracked. You know? yeah. Oh darn, we do have termites, you know, and then watching that unfold is kind of strange. My dad got into flip this bar and restaurant in New York City in the 1960s and 70s. So he'd find a bar was kind of down on its luck. He'd get it cleaned up, spit shine, get it working, and then he'd move on, go to another place. I had about six places at one point in New York City, working around. I was the oldest of four boys. His hiring philosophy was he'd rather breed his help than hire it. <laughs> You've been there. Yeah, okay. So there I am, 1964, uh, 31 December, 5 a.m. in the morning, and I hear, and I look down at the foot of the bed, my dad's there, says, let's go. Okay, so I get up, it's kind of cold, I get dressed, get in the car, drive down to Nagel Avenue to the bar on Nagel Avenue, he opens the gates, he says, okay. You sweep and mop the floors, get the bathrooms, don't forget the urinals, get downstairs, get the ice, get the beer, get the sodas, get it out of the basement, get it up, get the bar stocked, you got till five minutes to eight, get moving. Bars in New York can be open from 8 a.m. in the morning till 4 a.m. in the morning in New York City. Yeah. And you know, which means if you want to get any cleaning done, things done, big things done, you got from four in the morning to late in the morning. So I'm there, I'm working like a private on payday, flying around getting stuff done and everything else, never once doing it the standard. And at five minutes to eight, my father reaches in his pocket and gives me five bucks. <sighs> Forgot to tell you something. 31 December is my birthday. I was 10 years old that day. <laughs> So I looked at my dad and I had kind of a typical mopey look on my face as a kid, you know. My father goes, what? I said, well, it's my birthday. I kind of thought you're, you know, going to bring me down here, work me, you're going to have a present for me, maybe a bike and a cool present or something. And my father showed the generational difference when he looked at me and he says, uh, I gave you a job for your birthday. <laughs> I could have given that job to somebody else. I gave it to you. Lucky me. <laughs> so I'm working every Saturday, every Sunday, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning. So good news was it didn't compete with anything else. You know, I had plenty of time to be in sports and do everything else because there weren't a lot of games going on at 5 a.m. in the morning, you know. So I would do that and then I'd go out and go, you know, play and practice, do whatever I was doing. And we were, all, we we're four boys, we we're all athletes, we we're all that. So I'm doing that and I'm 16 and I'm working on 39th Street down from 5th and 6th Avenues between the two. And I'm mopping the floor for about the 300th time. And my father leans over the bar and says, uh, Vincent, you better do a good job there. This is all going to be yours someday. And I remember leaning over, squeezing that mop head. And I'm there right now. And I remember squeezing that mop head, saying to myself, Jesus, Mary, and sweet St. Joseph, I've got to get plan B. <laughs> the Army was my plan B. I didn't join the Army because what I wanted to do. I didn't join the Army because I wanted to be a general. I didn't join the Army because I wanted to. I joined the Army because if I wasn't doing that, I was going to be mopping floors at Bolson's Bar for the next 20, 30 years. Now, my dad wasn't a bad man. He took good care of us everything else. But working for dad didn't butter my biscuit. You with me? Yeah. It did, didn't float my boat. Didn't work. Got him all excited. I'd kind of go, eh. You know, but he said, well, I got a plan. Well, okay, I got a plan. So I had to go away to school. Went away to school, the ROTC guy saw me one day working out and said, hey, uh, we got these ROTC scholarships. You want one? We'll pay your next like few years of school. And then you owe us four years. And people would look at me and say, so they're going to pay two years of college, you got to owe them four years. That doesn't sound fair. And I was sitting there going, well, you're, you're just, your criteria is wrong. <laughs> That's four years I ain't mopping floors in Bowles' Bar. That's what I'm, I'm doing. So I went away to do that, said I'd do it for four years. 33 years later, I'm standing in the Pentagon Auditorium having a retirement ceremony. So things kind of happen. The question you should be asking is, so how do you get from that guy to this guy? And I'll ask again, who works with you? Who works for you? Who are you touching? Because the reason I got from there to here was because people reached out and touched me and people pushed me. And people told me when well, my best wasn't good enough, I didn't do a little bit better. So my question to you is, who are you touching? Who are you making a difference in? 
Who are you realizing that a word from you could make the difference between a day or a week going really well or a day and a week not going so hot? Because the difference between management and leadership, I find, is often misunderstood, but when you boil it down, it's not complicated. Management's a clipboard and a task list. It's important and it's stuff you gotta do. I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. Management is directive. Leadership is how you get that done. Leadership is connective. How do you connect with folks? How do you find out what works for them, what trips them? I, I go around the country, I've seen an interesting dynamic change in the nine years I've been speaking around to audiences. When I started nine years ago, nine, ten years ago, somebody would always put their hand up in the back of the room. General! Yeah. Baby boomer. Yeah. I'm leading a bunch of these to be bleep bleep millennials. They don't get it. There's that witching on the phone all the time. I, I, I can't understand it. Okay. Then, you know, my answer usually doesn't go over well. We'll get into that in a second. Well, now, interesting dynamic has changed. I'm going around talking to audiences now. Hands go up. Millennials are putting their hands up. Gerald, I got a question to you. I got all these baby boomers working for me. They ain't getting it. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, they come in at 7 o'clock in the morning, they sit there at their desk, they have lunch at their desk, they work till 5.30 in the evening, they're, they're there at their desk, all, they ain't getting anything done. What, what do they do? They're behind in technology, they can't get with it, they can't pick up the pace. Every time I want to do something, it's, well, they're kind of slow in my day. But when are they going to get it? Whoa. And then people put up their hands, what do we do? I say, and I look at the baby boomers, I go, well, you millennials too. And they get very offended, like I insulted them or something. So, what do you mean? Yeah, you millennials. Ask your parents. <laughs> Every generation changes. My mom and dad, 1964, lying in bed looking at each other saying, we have failed. <laughs> I mean, he likes the Rolling Stones and, you know, is on his phone all day. He doesn't like Perry Como. Where have we gone wrong? <laughs> Look it up, okay? <laughs> huh? Every generation changes. Technology is their way of controlling. The other very interesting dynamic I'm seeing now, we have lost the battle of control, we boomers have lost the battle of controlling millennials and technology. They own their phones. You want to get to them, you got to get through their device. Okay? My, my wife, God love her, she's almost in the 21st century technology wise. We've almost got her there. We do. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, she looked at me, we have, we've not been blessed with children, we have six godchildren, five of whom are still with us. And our oldest is Ashley, and my wife looks up, my wife and Ashley are very tight, and my wife looks at me and says, why won't Ashley call me? <laughs> we've had this conversation before, so I take a deep breath and go, she goes, don't give me that texting thing. <laughs> okay, you're right, I won't. So I reached in, pulled up my phone. Ashley, Uncle V here, how are you? Beep, I don't know. You know the drill. 30 seconds, 45 seconds, bing, I go there. <laughs> My wife's an introvert. She's got a, like, that's got to percolate for a while. So she goes, hmm. A couple of days later, she comes back. She goes, okay, show me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my wife gets on, now hang in there with me, this really happened, she gets in there, Dear Ashley and Cheryl here, this is my first text, hope you're well, my, I know too long, it's her first one, give her a breath. <laughs> Boom, sends it off, boop. Wife puts the phone down, goes to another room, she hears, bing, she comes running in. Picks it up, goes in the bedroom to read it, I'm in the kitchen. All of a sudden I hear, ah! <laughs> so what? My wife comes out, she's holding the phone. Ashley's answer. Okay. <laughs> I go in another room. Dear Ashley, Aunt Cheryl needs a little more. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> now, a couple of years later, they're, they're texting the, the two of them back, back, forth, all the time, back, forth. But what's interesting dynamic I've watched is watch millennials control the technology of their children. Go to Millennial House, they're tech-free zones. I've got friends, I walk in their house and I walk in, and there's a basket there, I go, oh, that's where the devices go, put yours in there. We come to the dinner table, we, we put them in there. We go in the kitchen, we put them in there. They're taking very 
upfront things to control their children and technology as their children gets older. It's kind of, every generation evolves, every generation changes. But management's directive, leadership's connective. Okay? Uh, what do you want to talk about? What are your questions or thoughts? I don't know, we paid you to be here. What do you got? <laughs> thoughts? Questions? What keeps you awake at night? <laughs> if I'm looking at, sir? Making the connection between a very young crew that's millennials, even maybe younger, and this, I'm going to use the old, much older generation, baby, baby boomers. Speak baby for yourself. Huh? I am. <laughs> Getting that connection to where you can both speak the same language mm -hmm. about something that there's not necessarily a dictionary for. And the question is? The question is, is how do you make that connection? First, uh, you, you have to understand, I've, I've, I've found, and I'll own this, I found that it requires persistency and consistency. Often the only time, we, we don't want to talk to them because we don't like their technology, so do we increase our interactions with them or decrease our interactions with them? Decrease. 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 So the only time they see us is when we got a problem. And they're so excited when they see us walking toward them because they know what's coming. So what I got to do is, what I often ask is, I say, what do you think? I'm trying to work this, what do you think? I interact, if, if you work for me, you interact with me daily. Okay. But, well, you, but you have to force the interaction. Be careful about the only time we interact is when I got a crisis. Because then they start going, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm about to have a problem, my problem's walking up. Okay. So I find force that. The other thing is, ask them what they think. But the real key I found, is, I found two keys. One is I ask a lot of questions. And I ask them what they think. The other thing I do is, and don't look at me, you're all going to look at me funny. I have found one most powerful word when I'm working with people and I want to connect with them. One question, one word. And I use it about five or six times. Try it the next time you're talking to somebody. Just when someone says, well, I'm trying to do this, just look and go, because? Well, because I'm trying to, because? Well, this is what, because? The other thing I found is with the, the young, younger generations, their attention span is narrower. Uh, I'm, I'm coaching some folks in my coaching practice. Older folks, hour and a half, two hour sessions is what they need. Because they use the session to kind of work stuff out in their head. I get them out of their desk or office, they sit down, and they get away from all the phones and emails and everything else, and they're able to talk about something they've been wrestling with and kind of been working in there. You with me? Okay. Younger generation, an hour tops. An hour tops. They're not using their phones when I'm talking to them, everything else, but they get so many impulses and inputs and everything else, I got to hit them hard up front. Here's what we're going to I give them an agenda as soon as they walk in. Here's what we're going to do. What about this? What about this? Here was your assignment. You get this done. You do this. You do this. You do this. Boom. I got one young man I'm, I'm coaching mentoring. And I do a uh, thing where every day at 4.30, he's got to give me a report on his five focus areas, five to seven focus areas. School, money, family, relationships, red, green, amber. How's he doing? But miss. His mom is in shock that I get him to do that every day. Because at 4.25, an alarm goes off. It says, boom, oh, report, boom, and it comes in. He just technology wires himself to do that. Now, I push back with questions, and he goes, hmm. What does amber mean? What does red mean? What, and then we meet once a week. I lay that out and say, okay, what, 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 tell me what that means. So you've got to force the interaction. You've got to be persistent, consistent, and you've got to be patient. They don't see things the way we see them. The last thing I found I have to do is, and I've done this with seniors as well, is you've got to tell them something they don't know. You've got to tell them something they don't know. They've got to learn something from you. I had a boss once had had my job 
and had done my job really well. And if I needed to find out, I just asked him. You know, he made sure. I always knew he had done my job. Uh, so when I went to him about something, I'd usually hear, well, you know, when I had that, it wasn't a problem. You know, it didn't have a problem doing that. No. So to shake him up, I had to tell him something he didn't know. And he was going to make a decision about something. And I was absolutely convinced it was the wrong decision. And I had walked that ground. I had lived it and been part of it. He had heard about it, observed it, but I had lived it. So I made an appointment, sat him down, said, hey, you So he said, walked in the door. And he says, oh, I'm going to try to change my mind, are you? No, sir. Huh? I just want to show you what I'm seeing, and I want to hear what you're seeing, because I th for, from where I'm sitting, if we do this, it ain't going to work. So let me just tell you what, I, what I'm seeing. And I started laying it out, and about five minutes into it, a little light went off. and went, wait a minute. So you're telling me if we do this, this, and this, this is going to happen? Yeah. I thought if we did this, 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 that that was going to happen. No, sir. That's going to How do you know? Because I did that. I saw that happen. I know what you think is going to happen, but when they get to here, that happens. Hmm. And then the magic words happen. I didn't know that. Let me go work that a little more. So if you're going into a boss and you're having a disagreement, understand, I think you're wrong. That's not going to go very far. Let me tell you what I'm seeing, and could you share with me what you're seeing? I call it the sacrificial lamb theory. I walk in, hi, could you help me? I'm, here's what I'm saying. Maybe you can share something with me and show me what you're seeing. I'm missing something here. And then usually along the conversation, one of two things happens. I learn something I didn't know, and I go, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, I got it now. Or the boss looks at me and goes, I didn't know that. Wait a minute. Hold it. Stop the presses. Don't do that. Okay, great. I'm sure you had your hand up. Hey, yeah, um, Was that helpful, sir? Yeah. Good. In your experience, you, you have the uh, baby boomers all the way down to the millennials. Is there any common interest of midway the road that you find that everybody can agree on? Uh, if you're willing to... Here's what, you, here's what you have to do. This is the learning zone, change zone. This is where change occurs. Over here, it's a comfort zone. We like being in our comfort zone. Yeah, you've heard that before. We, we, we love comfort zone. Over here, it's the panic zone. When you bring change in an organization, the first thing people think about is how does it affect What's going to mean to me? My, I, I was consulting with a guy yesterday, and they're getting ready to do a merger with a company. They said, we're going to go down and talk to him. Well, great. I said, uh, what are your expectations? There were three of them in the room. I said, what are your expectations when you go talk to him? He said, we're going to do A, B, C. I looked over the other side. What are your expectations to talk to him? We're going to do X, Y, Z. The third person said, we're going to do L, M, L, P. <laughs> I went, okay. And the three of them started looking at each other like, uh-oh. And then I asked that question, I said, what are their expectations down there? You're acquiring these people, what are their expectations? Looked at me like I had a third eye growing out of my head. <laughs> what you have to do as a leader is set the conditions to get people out of their comfort zone, but keep them out of their panic zone. And you've got to talk. So one of the things you have to do to connect with millennials, connect with other generations, connect with people, is you've got to get out of your comfort zone. You know? They don't like listening to my music. I can't understand theirs. They do things differently. But one of the great things happens, whenever my wife and Ashley meet, she's up in Buffalo, my wife goes up about every other month or so, whenever they go out, one of the things they do when they go out to dinner is they, Cheryl puts her iPhone down and says, show me. And says, you can do this, you can do this, you can, okay, it becomes their little thing. And they're both empowered and they both feel good. So get out of your comfort zone I'm going to panic zone. But get out of your comfort zone and say, what do you think? The intera force the interaction. Uh, they, the, sports, I've got to watch that. Sports, the, the, the normal traditional sports don't appeal to them as well. NFL viewership is going down. It's down 7 to 10% this year, this, this, next, this past year. College football, they get a little excited, but not that much. They're into snowboarding, extreme sports, 
things of that nature. There's this thing called COD, Call of Duty. They're on it all the time. Four or five hours a day, they're on. That's their connection. I'm coaching this one young man who loves Call of Duty and his mom doesn't understand it. I said, have you ever sat down with him and watched him do it? No! I did. I was in combat a lot. I went out there. It scared the hell out of me. <laughs> but I sat down and said, show me what you're doing here. So you gotta, you got to force it. you got to get out of your comfort zone. Okay. Good. Uh, what else can I answer for you? Because I know it's, uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome. You've talked about um, you know dealing with the different individuals like millennials probably for most of us and I learned to text so I could talk to my kids. Uh, <laughs> you laugh. But, but um, you know oftentimes we have teams of people working together and you've got a mixture mm -hmm. and uh, so how do you have an environment that makes all of these people feel comfortable and, and they have different comfort zones and different panic zones and uh, the first is. Uh, when I coach people, it's very interesting. I find I do three things when I coach folks, when I work with folks. First, I give them time. We have meetings. This meeting is a time for us to focus on stuff and get stuff done. Second, I give them a process. You come in. Here's what we're doing today. You got a piece of this. Show up. Do this. And when they don't do it, you call them on it. Hey, you had to come today with this. Uh, yeah, I know. You didn't do it. When we started out doing those reports with that young man, uh, how do I break this to you gently? He was not as religious about adhering to the schedule as we started out. And about the third day, I called him and said, I called my phone. Mom said he won't answer. I said, watch. I just kept calling. By about the 19th time, he answered. I said, when are we going to start, when are you going to start doing what you signed up for? So you got to have a process and you got to make sure they understand what their part of it is. A lot of times we have meetings and I watch people have meetings and I'm, one of the things I always do when I coach you guys, I say, let me go sit in one of your meetings. And I watch in. Have you ever had meetings where everybody kind of looks around the table and says, mm-hmm, they all nod like this? Then they go out in the hallway and they go, well, I hope somebody's going to do something about that. <laughs> we don't do, uh, I, I, you give them a process and say, you want to do this, end your meetings a different way. Here's how we normally end meetings. Has everybody got it? And everybody says what? Yeah. Uh, any questions? No. no. And you'd hurt somebody who had a question. Because you'd say, hey, I got to get out of here. I got something else I got to go do. You got a question, send them an email later. I mean, I got to go. <laughs> well, make are there any questions the next to last question you ask? Say, so are there any questions? Everybody's going to say, no. Yeah. And then do this. So tell me what you got to do between now and the next meeting. Tell me what you got to do between now and the next meeting. Tell me what you got to do between them. Now, the first time you do that, you won't be able to drag barbed wire out of their butts with a tractor. <laughs> you won't. They'll be sitting there going, ooh, I didn't pay attention, I didn't hear, could you go over it again, I was looking at my phone, and just hang in there. Now, you got to watch it because your discomfort at their discomfort is going to make you do what the next time? Not do it. How oh, they felt uncomfortable, I won't do that. No, no, three weeks. Three weeks you do that. At the end of every minute, you just say, so what do you got to do next? What do you got to do next? What do you got to do next? And here's what starts to happen. They start going up to each other before the meeting and go, you know he's going to ask. <laughs> oh, we got to get ready for this. The other thing that starts happening is when they get into the rhythm and they're going to do it, and your first name is? Stacy. And your first name, sir? Greg. Greg. Stacy says, I'm going to do A, B, C. Greg says, no, 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 no. I I've already got D, and D's right next to C. Let me take C. I got it. And all of a sudden, the meeting moves from something they want to get the heck out of so all of a sudden it becomes a coordination mechanism where they start getting stuff done and they stop looking at each other for the Wednesday meeting on Tuesday night going, what are we going to do about that? What did we talk about last week? The third thing that I do, so the first thing I said with working with folks is I give them time, I give them process. The third most critical thing I found I do in coaching, and I didn't start out understanding this, it's just come to me, is I don't judge. I don't judge. I go, okay, tell me more. If you're saying something I don't get, I don't look at you and go, that's stupid. I don't understand. I go, tell me more. Tell me what you're seeing. It's called empathy. Tell me what you're seeing. Make sure you know the difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy, I, I, I feel bad, you feel bad. Empathy, I feel why you're feeling bad because I've been there. I lost my mom. I, I, f I feel bad because you lost your mom. You put yourself in that person's position. Sympathy is more distant. Empathy is you're there. 
And I find if you do that, the connection starts to form. The other thing is, we're an impatient bunch. We want to solve everything in like, you know, 29 minutes. You know, some things take time. Okay? Uh, John, I know uh, their time is precious and they've all got to go somewhere. What other questions would you have? <laughs> well, you can sing three verses of the Army song, which is fine with me. <laughs> so probably one of the most provocative chapter headings you have in your book is causes of stress. Yes. So within organizations, what have you, in, in ones that you've commanded and ones that you've been involved with, what are some common themes there? Uh, the question was causes of stress. I, th I found there are two, two causes for stress. That's the four, three, two, one. The two is the two reasons for stress in organizations. Okay, now, you don't have to believe this. Just believe I believe it. All right? Two reasons for stress in organizations. You, the boss, know something your folks don't know. And if they knew it, they could get their job done better. If you told them why it was so important to get this done or focused them or everything else, told them it would work. And it came to me when I was working with a group and I was consulting, I was going around talking and asking questions. And the last thing I always ask people when I'm interviewing them is, is there anything else I forgot to ask? Yeah. The boss is, if you want to get the boss excited, we're a hundred million dollar company, but if you want to get the boss excited, talk about the ABC project. It's only like a hundred and twenty thousand, hundred and fifty thousand dollar project. But you can spin him up about anything, just talk about that project, he gets all excited. Oh, we, we don't understand what the big deal is. And you know, you hear it one time, it's a data point, you hear it a couple of times, it's an emerging trend. You, you know, everybody I'm talking to, I start to hear this, it's a trend. So when I'm doing the out brief to the boss, you know, what my assessment had found out, I said, yeah, you might want to talk to him about the ABC project. And he goes, well, they don't need to know that. I said, you might want to talk to him about the ABC. He said, you really think? I said, it couldn't hurt. So when he talked to him, he said, here's the deal. <coughs> We have been subs. You know what subcontractors are? We have been subs on every project. Now, we've made good money and been subs, but there's another contract coming up that we can get to be a prime on, but to be a prime on it, we've got to show past performance. And if we do the ABC contract well, that's going to give us past performance to bid as a prime on that in 18 months from now. And I want to do that. That's important to us, because I want to get out of the sub business. I want to be a prime. What was everybody's reaction? <laughs> got it. <laughs> got it. A couple months later, I said to the boss, how's it going? He said, geez, all they want to talk about now is the ABC project. They can't even do anything else. <laughs> but he knew something they didn't know, and it was spinning them up. The other reason for stress, the folks know something the boss doesn't know. And they're trying to figure out if it's okay to tell him or her. Every organization I go in, there's two dynamics that are always working. Every organization I go in, there are two dynamics always working. Boss is up at the top going, I wonder how it's really going out there. There's somebody at the bottom going, does anybody above me know how stupid this is? <laughs> Present company excluded. No. <laughs> but there just are, you know? And the answer is, maybe somebody does, maybe somebody doesn't. One of the, I always get asked, how do, uh, how do uh, you know, what's, what's an important quality for leaders to have? And I find the most important quality for leaders to have, I've learned this over time. I had hair when I started to learn it. How do you take bad news? How do you take bad news? Because bad things happen in great organizations. How do you take bad news? If your attitude when bad news comes in is you're reaching below the desk and pulling out a flamethrower to take folks out, bad news didn't come into you. <laughs> it didn't. So you're going to find out the hard way. You're going to find out on the front page of the paper. You're going to find out when some lawyer walks up and says, here's the suit for $40 million. You know, and that's when you're going to find out about stuff. You're not going to find out about stuff when you could make a difference in doing it. So I said, how do you take bad news? I had a boss once, and I'll finish with this. I had a boss once. Uh, we, we, he'd been our boss for about three weeks. And we were working on an operation that had started before he got there. And we screwed this up. We couldn't have screwed this operation up worse if we'd written everybody a letter of instruction and said, here's your piece of screwing it up. <laughs> don't, forget, don't miss a step. We screwed it up. It was bad. And we're screwed up. It's, we're at the road junction. It's all terrible. He drives up. We're oh, God. He gets out, takes a look, says, well, this isn't going very well. So I was amazed. He said, Major Bowles, would you clean us all up and you know, meet everybody back, get everybody back in my office about 5 o'clock tonight. Yes, sir. Got it. So nobody's late for that. 4.45, we're all sitting around the table. And we're all playing that game you all know about. We're all playing that game. We're all looking around saying, who's going under the bus? <laughs> you know the old joke at Vegas, you know, if you're sitting at the table, you don't know who the dummy is, it's you. Well, if you can't figure out who's going under the bus, it's you. So we're all looking, okay, and then you start asking yourself, well, if I'm going under the bus, do I throw myself under the bus? Do I make them drag me under the bus? Do I take somebody with me when I'm going under the bus? You know what do you do? 
And the boss walks in, we all stand up, he says, sit down, he says, uh, that didn't go well. New boss, first impression. That didn't go well. No, no sir, it didn't. He said, um, I need to know what I should have done differently to help you be successful. He's throwing himself under the bus? <laughs> Well, what is this? He goes, no, no, no. He said, my job is to put you in positions to be successful because I know you're all working hard. And if we have something that doesn't go right, it means I didn't do something. So I need to know what it is because I don't want that to happen again. He had us for the next two years. He had us. Because he wasn't about finding fault. He was just about making the organization better. And he went in with the attitude of my job is to put you in a position to be successful. My job isn't to catch you doing something wrong all the time. Whoa. Last thing I'll leave you with is, whether you like it or not, the TV show Saturday Night Live has passed the test of time. 44 years. 11.35, 18 live shows a year, starts at 11.35 on Saturday night, goes to 1 o'clock Sunday morning. They have a cast party, they all come to sometime on Monday morning. And they all roll back in and say, who's the guest host this weekend? Who's the musical talent? What's going on in the news? Let's put a show together. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday they work. And Saturday, boom, show goes on. A columnist for New York Magazine thought that would be an interesting story. So he started watching a week, you know, went on, watched the cast, made notes, watched, and was doing it. And he went to Andy Samberg at the time, one of the stars of the show, and he said, how do you get ready to go on Saturday Night Live? How do you get ready to do this? Andy Samberg's lesson, I thought, was pretty insightful, his answer. He said, we don't go on because we're ready. We go on because it's 1135. <laughs> Red light's on at 11.35. They're not taking a black screen. We go on, whether we're ready or not. There's a leadership lesson there I'd like to leave you with. While I've been talking this morning, you have been thinking about your leadership journey. You've been thinking about something, you, something I have said might have sparked something you think you need to do. We need to change a meeting. We need to interact with somebody differently. When you need to get out of your comfort zone, keep folks out of the panic zone. There's something's happened that you've been thinking about. And most of you aren't going to do it. You're not going to do what you're thinking about. I'm going to tell you why. You're not going to do it because you're waiting for what doesn't come. You're waiting for the perfect time. I'll do it next quarter. I'll do it next fiscal year. I'll do it next project. I'll do it when Jane leaves and, you know, Greg starts the new job. I'll leave it when the new project comes. I'll start, you, you got the drill? You put it off, you put it off, and a year later, what happens? You're still looking, saying, I meant to get around to that. I never got around to it. So my advice to you is, if you see something's got to get done, begin the process of doing it. It won't be perfect. I have seen the strive for perfection screw up and ruin more organizations than anything. Because people don't want to do anything until it's perfect. Make your goal progress, not perfection. Your folks don't w wake up in the morning and go, I'm working for him. He's perfect. <laughs> I'm working for her. She's perfect. They don't say that. What they say is, when I work with that person, when I interact with that person, I'm better than I was before. I'm better working with that person than I am before that person came here. I'm progressing. And if you make your goal progress, not perfection, you're going to get the reputation of being the type of person that sees that something's got to get done and they move out and start doing it, as opposed to the alternative. I want to thank you so very much for the privilege of the platform. Uh, I'm going to be outside at a table there. The books are already signed, but if some of you would like, or all of you would like them personalized with your names on them or to someone else, I have people come up sometimes, i got a nephew, got a son, got someone in the service, like to, I'd be more than happy to do that. I want to thank you very much for what you do. You touch every single person in this community every single day. What you do touches every community every day. The things we couldn't do if you didn't do your job are just, I can't even begin to count it. So you make a great difference and we only notice it when it, the lights don't go on. <laughs> thank you all so very much. God love you. Thank you.